whiteboards. That's really clever. Now, remember yesterday we said that if you had any questions, you could put them in the chat or email them to us and we would do our best to answer some of them. So we've got two questions today. Both of them have to do with the um, the voting thing we did yesterday. So in the question where we're asking if a Teams meeting has a lower carbon footprint than driving to a Teams meeting, someone very cleverly asked, does it matter how many people are on the Teams meeting when calculating if it has a lower carbon footprint than driving to an in-person meeting? And the short answer is yes, but the long answer is that two people in a Teams call for one hour produce a small amount of carbon, 0 0.0037 kilograms. The numbers aren't exactly important because the basic point is that's the same amount as driving a tiny sliver of a mile in the average petrol car. Now keep in mind all of these numbers are averages because obviously different kinds of car produce different amounts of emissions. So 440 classes, not people, in a call for the same amount of time like we had yesterday would be roughly 0.8 of a kilogram. But turning off your camera like we have this week cuts the footprint of your call by up to 96%. So online meetings are definitely much less of a carbon footprint than driving. But then someone else cleverly asked, does it matter if it's an electric car when comparing traveling to a meeting to one on Teams? Because you lot are just far too good at this. <laughs> so the short answer is again, yes, but the long answer though is because although electric cars don't have a tailpipe, they do require charging and that energy has to come from somewhere. And in many places, generating electricity relies on fossil fuels. But in Scotland, as Jamie mentioned yesterday, we have been able to produce 98% of our electricity needs with renewable resources. But what does this mean for using electric cars, especially if more people start to use them? It means that we'll have an increased use for electricity, which means that we need to think about expanding our ability to produce energy in a low carbon way from renewable sources. Otherwise, we'll be charging our cars, which are electric, with fossil fuels, which doesn't make any sense if you're thinking about a low carbon lifestyle. Now, I have a quick quiz for you, but because yesterday the chat went very quickly, we kind of underestimated just how enthusiastic all of you are about learning about climate change. So today, instead of putting your answers in the chat, what you're going to do is you're going to take this quiz with your teacher. I'm just going to tell you the, the questions now so you can think about it while you watch our presentation from our guests. So think about these questions, have a go at the quiz in your class, and then let us know on social media later on after this lesson how you've done, okay? So your questions to think about are, can you remember the name of any of the greenhouse gases? And can you remember how we are producing some of these gases? And the third question, can you remember why do we call them greenhouse gases? Now, a note for your teachers, this quiz is in the folder of resources, so you don't need to write anything down. And if you don't have the link or the link isn't working for you because we had a tiny technological problem with SharePoint, please email us at ecoschools at keepscotlandbeautiful.org and we'll send you the link again. Okay, so tell us how many you can remember. Let us know how you did on social media. Right, now, I am going to hand over to our friends and we will learn about how climate change is affecting wildlife. So take it away, Adam Brazou. Hello, Matt and Bye, everyone. My name is Jess, um, as Katrina said, and I'm here at Edinburgh Zoo. And I'm also going to be joined in this session by my colleague Jasper, who is all the way up in the Highland Wildlife Park. And these two parks are looked after by the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland, which is a charity um, that looks after our animals here, our animals in the Highland Wildlife Park, and also conservation projects around the world. So we're going to take you to see some of our animals in Edinburgh, we're going to see some in the Highlands, 
And we'll be learning about some of their adaptations, some fun facts about our animals. But also we want to take a moment to think about how they might most be affected by climate change. So at each animal, we'll ask you a couple of questions to challenge how much you know about animals, maybe also about climate change. And we'll get you to vote for the answers in your classes. So the way we kind of thought we might work is if you uh, raise your hand for the answer you think is right, we'll give you some options. Teachers, if you could count hands for the most popular option. And we'll also have a poll running for you to then share your class's answers. So we'll remind you of how that will hopefully work in your classes when we ask our questions. And let's see who's first. I'm going to turn my camera around and show you our first animal, which hopefully you can easily figure out um, is our massive colony of penguins here at Edinburgh Zoo. We have uh, about 130 penguins, one of them nice and close up for us to have a good look at just now. Um, so we have lots of different features that all penguins tend to share in common. You can see from this one up close, they all have a pointy beak. They all have these flippers to help them swim. They all have webbed feet to help them swim and keep stable on the ground as well. And we know about maybe why we have those, why penguins have those features. Um, but one feature I want us to think about today for our first question is their black and white feathers, which you might not have thought of before. So my first question is, and if it's possible to get the first poll up and running, um, that would be brilliant. Our first question is, which of these is not likely to be a reason why penguins have these black and white feathers? Oh. So you might not have thought of it before. I'll say our options quickly and then I'll get you to vote if you can. So which of these is not likely to be a use for their black and white feathers? Is it A, keeping warm? Is it B, camouflage? Or is it C, attracting a mate? So I'll say those options now slowly if you can hear me over the penguins yelling. Which of these is not likely to be a use for their black and white colored feathers? So if you could raise your hand if you think it's not keeping warm. And teachers, if you can count. And if you raise your hands, if you think it's camouflage that they won't use that color for. And then raise your hand if you think it's attracting a mate that they won't use those colors for. So why do we think? So I'll give you a little minute to have a think and I'll try and point out some excellent features of our penguins. We've got Gentoo penguins, rock copper penguins and king penguins here at Edinburgh Zoo. And they all live together in the same enclosure and you would find them all in very similar habitats in islands in the South Atlantic Ocean. So not all penguins live in the deep Antarctic. Many of them live in places where the weather is really very similar to Scotland. So you can see they're all happy enough hanging out outside and having a swim um, in our rainy uh, September Scottish weather. They're not desperate for snow just now. So some answers coming in of what you think might not be a use for the black and white feathers. And quite a range, actually. We're all kind of going for lots of different ones. I'm not seeing too many of them being exactly the same. Um, while you're answering, I'm going to maybe nip around the side and show you some of our king penguins. Um, so, I can reveal, while you've been voting, um, I'll get to our other penguins and you can see our king penguins up close. The black and white colour Eight. Oops. Hang on. Hi, we Sorry. just missed you for a second, but you're back now. That's Sorry. good. I'm back. I'm sorry. That's okay. Awesome. Yeah. Um, but yes, so they're 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 not likely to be used for their black and white color feathers. Eight. Just so you're cutting out a bit. I think maybe if you go back to where you were, the reception is probably a lot better. Yeah. No problem at all, can do. So that was our king That's penguins, better. if you can see them. So there's just can you repeat the answer, we're... please? Yes, of course. So the answer to that question is C, attracting a mate. So that is 
the reason, what, the, what, less likely to be the reason why they have these black and white feathers. So the main purpose of their black and white feathers is camouflage. The black on their backs helps them to blend in with the dark bottom of the ocean to hide from a predator above them. White on their tummies helps them to blend in with the light sky above to hide from a predator below them. They might also use their black feathers for keeping warm. So that dark color of their feathers will absorb heat and can keep them warm if they live somewhere very, very cold. So you might see them with their backs to the sun uh, on a sunny day. And when they lie down on their fronts, like you can see many of them doing just now, they can absorb the heat of the sun and keep themselves warm. So that was our first penguin question. I'm gonna slowly move back to where I was. Hopefully that will improve our signal. And our second question about our penguins is about how they are most affected by climate change. Now, I mentioned we've got rockhoppers, king penguins, gentoo penguins. These types of penguins can all be found in places rather than deep in the Antarctic. They live in parts of the world where the weather is very similar to us here in Scotland. Um, but if we have the second poll up, uh, our question for penguins about climate change is how are these types of penguins rockhoppers, kings, and gentoos most likely to be affected by climate change? Is it A, forest fires? Is it B, melting ice caps in the North Pole? Or is it C, rising sea temperatures? So I'll read those again. How are these types of penguins, king penguins, rockhopper penguins, and gentoo penguins most likely to be affected by climate change? Is it A, forest fires? Is it B, melting ice caps in the North Pole? Or is it C, rising sea temperatures? So I hope you guys were able to hear the question there. Um, if you want to find the poll. can hear you, Jess, but um, every time you move, it goes a bit glitchy. Fast, so. Brilliant. Sometimes the technology isn't always on our side, but thank you. I know, it's hard to do this from outside. Yeah. Okay. So That's actually well, suddenly a lot better. Suddenly, strange technology always a bit glitchy, but thankfully we're good. Okay, let me know if there's ever any more glitches and I'll hopefully be able to move to a place where the signal is a little bit better. Lots of us getting answers in there in the chat. So thinking about why they're most likely to be affected by climate change. Lots of us putting C, some of us putting B. So I will just wait another wee minute and you can listen to the sultry tones of our penguins. So sometimes they'll sing to each other to let each other know where they are. Sometimes they'll make a lot of noise. If there's a warning needed, for example, if there's a seagull, coming into the enclosure, which happens quite a lot. They'll make some noise as well. All right, so for our second question there, how are they most affected by climate change? The answer is C, rising sea temperatures. So forest fires are not that likely to affect them. Some penguins might live in places further north where you would find forest fires to be likely. Melting ice caps in the North Pole, not necessarily likely to be a direct effect because we might find that they are more likely affected by ice melt in the, in the southern parts of the world in the Antarctic. But the reason why they might most be affected by climate change is rising sea temperatures. So changing sea temperatures in the oceans where the penguins rely on to find food, um, particularly for their chicks during breeding season, could lead to them having to travel further and further into dangerous waters where there are predators to find their food or maybe struggling to find food at all. And so they might end up not finding enough food to survive the breeding season, which could lead to us losing quite a lot of penguins over the next several years. So action that we can take here to try and reduce climate change, which you'll learn about today and throughout the week, can actually have an impact on our penguins far, far away. So I will, I'm down here in the south in Edinburgh but I'll pass up to my colleague Jasper in the north um, if he's ready to talk to you guys now. Hi guys. 
Thank you, Jess. Uh, welcome to the Highland Wildlife Park. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to turn my camera around and we are going to see a completely different animal from the northern hemisphere. Jess was in the southern hemisphere with her animals and I have a northern hemisphere animal and it is a polar bear and this is Walker. So, like you say, we're looking at the effect of climate change on animals. So what we're going to do, we're going to have our first question. So if we can have the poll up, that'd be brilliant. And the first question is, it's an easy one. What colour fur, what is the polar bear's fur? A color, what colour is the polar bear fur? There we go. So is it A, white, B, yellow, or C, clear and transparent? So hopefully you'll be able to answer that. So I'll repeat that. What colour is polar bear fur? Is it white? Is it yellow? Or is it clear? So now these are one of the largest bears that you'll see on the planet. So they are mainly carnivorous. So they like to eat meat. But most bears are omnivorous. So they eat both meat and veg. So you probably just thought, what's he just thrown in? Well, I've got some carrots and I've got some uh, apples and tomatoes and this is what the polar bears will also eat as well so now these animals are very especially adapted to living in the high arctic where it's very very cold in near the north pole so now they have big paws you can have a look at those paws they are enormous now they have these big paws to spread their weight out on the thin ice when they're walking or when they're out hunting. They also have big paws because they are excellent swimmers. So they use their big feet as paddles. They're actually classed as aquatic animals. So because they spend a lot of time in the water and they are fantastic swimmers. Like I say, this is Walker. Oh yeah. Camera's a bit glitchy, just like Jess's. Could you maybe just um, stay still a little bit so we can get a good view of the bear, please? Especially All right, his sorry. lovely big paws. Yes, uh, it's when I throw the food, that's when I yeah. tend, to, tend to move. Sorry about that. No, it's so, okay. It's okay. So they've got uh, these big paws. And like I say, they are very well adapted to their environment. So have we got the poll in? Have we got any answers? So hopefully people have been uh, adding so what color fur is a polar bear oh quite a mixed one so it's not a it's not white it looks white it's not yellow it looks white it looks yellow but it's actually clear and transparent so it's also hollow now on the resources you can actually make your own polar bear fur and i've made a polar bear fur this is out of a piece of laminate and you can see here that it is actually transparent. It is also hollow and it traps the air in the hair. And this is what insulates them to keep them nice and toasty warm. So they are very well adapted to their environment. So I'm going to throw out some more food. So because he was about to wander off. So the keepers are starting to come around um, and he is going to be more interested in them in a minute. So now, like I say, world's largest land carnivore. Oh, just dropped the iPad. Bear with me. So now we're going to go on to our second question. How are polar bears affected by climate change? So is it A, they're not affected by climate change at all because it's always cold in the Arctic? Is it B? warmer longer summers Ooh. or is it c longer colder arctic winters so what is the answer so what do polar bears feed on well they don't get carrots and tomatoes and apples in the wild but they do get seals and that is their main source of food in the wild seals so and the seals live on the ice but what is happening to the ice well the ice is starting to melt it's starting to break up so now the feet uh, the seals live on the ice they breed on the ice so they have babies which then is food for the polar bears okay because the polar bears will eat all seals no matter what age so if there's no ice where are the seals going to breed 
Where are they going to live? How are they going to hunt? And this is a real knock on problem on the food chain for polar bears. So if their polar bear food disappears, the seals, what's going to happen to the polar bears? Well, the polar bears are going to disappear as well. So they reckon by 2050, polar bear population will be reduced by three quarters to two thirds. There will only be five to seven thousand polar bears by 2050 by the time you get to my age by 2100 polar bears could be extinct and that would be a real shame we don't want to lose these animals now we can do something about this we can reduce reuse and recycle so that we can ensure that these animals will be around for much much longer so now what was the answer to the poll, I hear you ask? So let's just have a quick look. So the answer was B, warmer, longer Arctic summers. So these longer, warmer Arctic summers are melting the ice. This is a real big problem for the polar bears. Like I say, they need the ice to survive. But when the summers come, they can actually go onto the land and survive. But if the summers are getting longer, that means it's they're having to stay on the land even longer, which is a problem because they can't get their favourite animal. So polar bears are actually classed as vulnerable at the moment. Um, so there's about 200, uh, sorry, 20 to 25,000 animals left in the wild, but they are declining. But it's not all doom and gloom. We can all do our bit, no matter how small our contribution to reduce, reuse, recycle, it is all very, very important. What I'm going to do now, I am going to hand over to Jess, who is with another amazing animal down in Edinburgh. Hello, thanks Jasper. So yes, I'm in Edinburgh Zoo again, and I am going to be chatting about another animal that is uh, one that's quite different habitat from the two that we've had just now. Something very lovely, very fluffy um, and very adorable. And um, our next animal is the koala. So if you can hear me OK, um, I will just ask my first question at koalas. So if we could have the next poll up and um, we might know lots about koalas. They have their babies in their tummies, sorry, in their pouches on their tummies. Uh, they live in Australia, um, but the question I'm going to ask you is what do they eat? So our three options are eucalyptus, bamboo or aloe vera. So if you could vote for what do koalas eat? Is it A, eucalyptus? Is it B, bamboo? Or is it C, aloe vera? So have a vote of those questions just now, or those answers just now, and see if you come up with colours here at Edinburgh Zoo. I'll show you a little picture just now because I don't want to go inside while I'm talking. They quite like very quiet uh, conditions, so they don't like me to be too loud whenever I head in. So I'll ask my questions out here. I'll show you our, our little koala here just now. We have got... Uh, three koalas in our first window where we'll go and one koala around the corner. Now, if you've ever been on the koala cam uh, on our website, which is great fun to watch, you'll have seen our boy Tanami. Now, you might know that koalas spend an awful lot of time asleep. And that is because the food they eat, the three options you've given there, one of those doesn't give them a huge amount of energy. So they just rest all the time until they wake up to eat. And the only time they'll ever really move a lot is if they're in danger. And so we will ask a little bit about, about that afterwards. So have we got any answers for our first question? Let's check in. Lots of people saying A, lots of people saying eucalyptus. Oh. What's the poll looking like? So I can <laughs> reveal in just a moment. Um, so is it what do koalas eat? A, eucalyptus, B, bamboo or C, aloe vera? The answer is A, eucalyptus. So most of their diet consists of eucalyptus. Now I'm in our little eucalyptus forest just before we enter into the koala's building here 
but it's a little bit rainy for me to take the iPad out. I can just show you one of our eucalyptus trees just over there. There are quite a few different types of eucalyptus and koalas can have their favorites. Humans wouldn't do very well if they ate eucalyptus because it can be, it's quite toxic. But koalas have very sturdy, well-adapted digestive systems to help them handle the toxicity in that plant they like to munch on so much. This is quite good because they're well designed to eat a food that not many other animals will eat. So there's not a lot of competition, but it can come with some problems because if you only eat one type of food as the main part of your diet, that means that if something was to happen to the eucalyptus forest where you live, your food might start to disappear, which you're very well designed to eat and maybe can't eat very many other types of food. So that can be a problem. And we'll link now to my, my next question about koalas. If we can have our next poll up for the koalas. My next question here is, how are they most likely to be affected by climate change? Your options, I'll read them out first and then slowly again so you can vote. Is it A, decreasing temperatures? Is it B, flooding? Or is it C, drought? So I'll read those slowly for you. How are koalas most likely to be affected by climate change? Is it A, decreasing temperatures? And you can raise your hands if you think it's A. Is it B, flooding? Raise your hands if you think it's flooding. Or is it C, drought? Now, while you think of the answer to that question and pop your answers in the poll, if you can, I'm going to make my way into the koala building. Now, forgive me just briefly if I do lose signal. Sometimes it can be quite tricky in here. So I'll go slowly. Um, and I think I see some eucalyptus shaking inside. So hopefully that means one of our koalas is awake. I'll go nice and slow. And if I need to, I'll come outside to answer my Question. So, hopefully, you can still hear me nice and slowly. I can still hear you. Flip the Fantastic. So, if you can see the rustle up there in the distance, oh no, Jess, I think I jinxed you. Oh, hopefully, she'll be back in a few minutes. So a few seconds, I should say. So she's just popped into the uh, the um, koala house, and they'll pop back up. Hello. There we go. Can you guys see me? Hear me? Can now, yes. But you disappeared when you went into the koala house, Jess. Sorry. No, it's okay. I'll go into the. I'll pop in from here and hopefully keep my signal and still be able to see Tanami, our boy, just around the corner here. You can see him there. So this is Tanami, our young male koala, who you can see is doing exactly what I said he would be, sleeping quite a lot. Um, so hopefully you're having a think about that question, how are koalas most affected by climate change? Was it A, increasing temperatures, B, flooding, or drought? And I can tell you now, the answer is C, drought. So koalas will be mainly and quite heavily impacted by drought in their habitat. So with climate change in parts of Australia has come more extreme temperatures and longer droughts, and with that, comes the increased risk of wildfires burning out of control. So you might have seen on the news about the terrible fires in Australia over the last couple of years, where millions of hectares of forest and bush in Australia have been lost. And that massively affects the koalas who live there and also different Australian animals that can be found only in these bushfires. Koalas are some of the animals you find in Australia and only in Australia. So, with that impact, climate change can come a massive impact on animals you find anywhere else in the world, which is why we have koalas like Tanami here in zoos across the planet. 
try and safeguard the species and make sure that if some horrible uh, catastrophe might happen in their habitat, for example, the bushfires in Australia might happen, we are still able to have a species or some of the animals here in the zoo. Now, Tanami's ears are slightly moving because he can hear me. They have those big, brilliant ears which catch lots of sound. So if there's any danger coming when they're having a good old snooze in the trees, they can wake up and move along uh, or climb hi higher up perhaps to avoid it. Now, as I said, they would only really come down to the ground if there's any kind of danger or if they're, for example, their trees are gone. And they can surprisingly move quite fast when they want to. And although they look cute and cuddly, they do have quite sharp claws to help them look after themselves. So I have chatted about Down Under. Jasper, are you ready to talk to us again in Scotland and the Highlands? I am indeed. So what we're going to do, we're going to be looking at a native species. So this is, I'm going to give you the scientific name first, and this is Felis sylvestris. What could that be, Felis sylvestris? Well, it means cat of the forest. And we have a cat of the forest here at the Highland Wildlife Park, sat on the top of this tree. And this is a Highland, uh, this is a wildcat, which is now found only in the Highlands of Scotland. So what we're going to do, we're going to ask the first question. So if we can have the poll up, the wildcat question is what percentage of the Caledonian forest is left? So Scotland used to be covered in 1.5 million hectares of forest, but we now only have, is it A, 3 to 4 percent, B, 5 to 6 percent or C, 7 to 8 percent? I'll repeat that. What percentage of the Caledonian forest is left? Is it A, 3 to 4 percent, B, 5 to 6 percent or C, 7 to 8 percent? Now, as I said, their scientific name means cat of the forest, and this is where we would find them. But unfortunately, we've lost a large proportion of our in natural environment for the wildcats. So wildcats have been found in Britain for thousands and thousands of years. In fact, they, they were never just found in Scotland. They were found all over Great Britain. They were in Wales and England and Scotland. But there have been some major problems. So the forest has become smaller and smaller. So climate change has reduced the forest. Now, climate change is natural. It's not always man-made, but when a, you have a natural climate change, it's usually a lot slower than what we're having at the moment. So we're having a very quick climate change, which is really difficult for the animals because they can't adapt quick enough to these changes. So now, what other problems have wildcats faced? Well, climate change, as I've already mentioned, loss of habitat, as I've already mentioned, but also people. People would hunt them for their fur. People would um, uh, uh, try and get rid of them because they see them as pests. But uh, we've also been encroaching into their environments. We've been cutting down their forests. We've been building houses and trees. This is called habitat fragmentation. So their habitats are getting smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually they can't hold any more animals and the animals can't survive. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to try a lens on here. So I'm going to see if this will zoom in a little bit closer. Uh, bear with me a second. Is that going to work? Oh, there we go. So. And there we go. Right at the top, we can see our wildcat. This is actually one of the females that we've got here. We've got um, three females. We've got mum. And we also have two kittens that were born last year. So now one of the big and exciting things that are happening here at the Highland Wildlife Park is that we are breeding these animals in captivity. But what we're going to do is we're going to do something really special is that we're going to breed them in captivity and then we're going to take them and we're going to put them back into the world. But we're not just going to throw them out. We're actually going to train them and we're going to get them used to living in a wild. And we have training enclosures where they can learn to be a wildcat and then they can be released into the wild. So 
this is all run by Saving Wildcats. This is one of our uh, branches of the RZSS charity, and we are looking after these animals here at the park, and then we will return them. So we have just received approximately £3.5 million of EU life funding, and we are working with local uh, organisations like... Um, the uh, Scottish National Heritage. Uh, we're working with uh, various other charities, Forestry Commission, um, so that we've got a nice safe place for these animals to return to. And we are looking at making uh, a huge area where we can have wildcats back in the wild. And this is always something that people say about zoos is you have these animals in captivity, but they never go back to the wild. Well, we are doing that with these animals. In fact, there are lots of animals that have actually been returned to the wild. So, like I say, you can look up on our website or the Scottish Wildcat website, uh, Saving Wildcats, um, and just do a search on Google and you will find it. So, going back to our question. So, what percentage of the Caledonian pine forest is left? So, the answer is A. 3.4%. So there's not much left at all. It's on the lower scale. So we've lost 96, 97% of the habitat that used to uh, that used to be home to the wildcat. But like I say, hopefully they will be seen again in the countryside, which is absolutely fantastic. Now, here we go. Awesome. Jess is Thank back. You, I'm going to hand, hand over back to Jess. See you later, guys. So yeah, it's so important for us to end on that positive note about being able to reintroduce a species into the wild because a lot of what we hear about the climate and nature is a bit doom and gloom, but there are things that humans can and are doing to protect the natural world, both in Scotland and all over the planet. Um, so I know you guys are building a climate action plan this week. We want to challenge you to choose something you can do right now or today, this afternoon, when you go home from school or at school today that you could do to help the natural world in Scotland particularly. So there's things we can do all over the world, uh, but something you could do that's specific for the natural world in Scotland. Could you go home and plant a seed? Uh, could you get your school to tweet about an important issue to raise awareness? What about starting a fundraiser for a Scottish na nature charity? Uh, maybe a little bake sale or something like that to raise money for a natural world charity right, just based here right in Scotland. So we want you to try and choose something that is something you can actually do and achieve in the next couple of days, uh, today or tomorrow. And we look forward to seeing and hearing about what you guys maybe come up with. Um, but with that little challenge, um, there's also some things that Jasper had mentioned, resources in the pack for you guys online to learn a little bit more about the animals we spoke about today. And I think, unfortunately, that might be the end of our little trip around the RZSS animals. Um, if you guys had any really, really important questions you want answered about the zoo or the animals or climate and nature, um, then the team here will send them on to us if they need our help answering them. And we'll definitely hopefully have them answered for you um, for tomorrow's session. Um, but I think that is where we will end up. Thank you so much to both of you. It's been so lovely to see all the animals and hear about all the things that you're doing in the zoo and in the wildlife center. So thank you again for joining us. Um, I know that there were a couple of people who said they just had a, a bit of a hard time seeing and hearing you, but everything was fine from my end. So hopefully everything will be fine in the recorded version. So if there's any schools out there that had a little bit of a hard time um, hearing you, they can have, an, have a look at the recorded version again, just to, to go over the bit that, that they, they missed. The recorded version will be in the resource folder shortly and we've been asked to share the link on the chat and i haven't done so yet just because there were so many answers going through so we'll we'll do that in, in a little bit just to make sure that everybody can get the fantastic resources that you've shared from rzss there's a really cool um file of resources in there in the tuesday folder for today i had um a couple of other things to go through and then we'll let you all go first of all I just wanted to remind everyone that you have your action plan to be working on. Yesterday, your task was to think of an aim 
that you wanted to accomplish with your action plan. And today I'm going to ask you to, like Jess said, to think of some actions that you can put on your action plan, things that you might like to do to tackle climate change. And we'd love to hear what you're thinking of. So if you could um, let us know either by email or in social media, some of the ideas that you're coming up with for your action plan, we'd love to hear how you're getting on with that. And the second thing is, you probably remember that at the end of the week, we're all going to celebrate with a One Planet picnic. And tomorrow's lesson is all about food and the environment and how we can make good food choices for the environment. So we'd love to hear all about your plans for your One Planet picnic especially after tomorrow's lesson. I know myself, we're going to have our own picnic and I am going to make an apple and bramble crumble because I love brambles. And also remember the quiz from the beginning of the lesson. We'd love to hear how you did with that. If you got all three answers right, then gold star for you. So please let us know on social media or by email how you did with that. We'd love to share your results. Um, our uh, account for social media is at KSB Scotland on Instagram, on Twitter and on Facebook. And we always, always love hearing from you. And um, also in the folder of resources, there is an evaluation. This is for educators, please, to fill out and let us know how we've done, what you can think of, any kind of um, uh, feedback that you might have for us and any questions that you might have. And also this um, evaluation will allow us to send you your certificate for attending some of the lessons this week. And we'd love to do that. We just need to make sure that we have the right place to send it to. So filling in the evaluation helps you and helps us. Um, anything else? I think that is about all we have for today. I want to thank you again for coming again today. It was so lovely to see you all. I can't wait to see you again tomorrow where we're going to learn all about climate change and food. So for that, we'll say thank you to Jess and Jasper once again from the RZSS. And thank you so much for going out in the rain and showing us the lovely animals and answering all of our questions. It was lovely to have you. Um, and we'll see Our everyone friend. again tomorrow. Same time, same place.